I'm Gene Coletta, editor of the Latin America Advisor Publications at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington. I'm speaking today with former Colombian finance minister, Mauricio Cardenas. Uh, he joins us via video from Bogota uh, to discuss the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic on Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Cardenas. Thanks, Jeannie. Pleasure to be in this interview. Great. And, and as we navigate this uncertain economic scenario in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you see the economic effects of COVID-19? Uh, what would you say are the best and the worst case scenarios for Latin America and the Caribbean? Well, what we're seeing is unprecedented. I don't think we can actually make any connection between what we're going through right now and things that have happened in the past. So that makes it very hard for projections. It's very hard to say, well, this is what's gonna happen with certainty or even with you know a range of uncertainty. Um, the um, consequences are devastating because the economies have been exposed to a sudden stop, but a real sudden stop, something that starts with, you know, uh, factories stop, stop producing, people don't go to work, uh, the lockdown, for example, that we're going through here in Colombia, uh, it's going to have uh, very serious impacts on the economy as a whole. So how to measure that? How to say, well, this is what's going to happen? It's really impossible at this stage. I've seen you know, projections that talk that countries like Mexico, for example, are going, go, are going to experience a 5% uh, GDP contraction. People are talking about zero growth in Colombia this year. But that's really, in my view, pure speculation. It's very hard to know at this point really what the consequences of all this are going to be. And so really there's no way of telling how long or how deep the recession can be. Is there any sort of even a worst case scenario that countries in the region should be preparing themselves for? Yeah, well, I think we should be prepared for negative growth. That's probably the more realistic assessment um as the economies have gone into a stage where very few activities are taking place now so um my view is that this quarter it's going to be and particularly the second quarter of the year it's going to be very negative in terms of uh, of growth what happens after the second quarter will depends on what we do now the measures, the policies that we adopt now, and also um, how lasting is the pandemic? Um, how long is it gonna take for the curve to flatten? How long is it gonna take for a um, uh, basically uh, treatments to appear? Um, how serious is this gonna go uh, as time progresses? So that's uncertain. So the only thing we can do really now is to adopt the right policies. And if we adopt the right policies, we're just going to mitigate this. I want to make sure that the consequences and the effects are less severe and less long lasting. Because one of the main issues today is that some of the effects that we're seeing because of the shock can have consequences that survive the shock, that survive the pandemic, that last longer than the pandemic. That's what we have to avoid. Now, you mentioned some of those policies that are important for countries to adopt now. Can you tell me a little bit more about those? What are the, the policies that countries should be adopting? What is it necessary for them to do right now to try to mitigate as much of this economic pain as possible? It's a combination of policies. I think the general thread, what I would just characterize these policies is that they're unconventional. They can't be orthodox. These are new policies for very challenging times. So they have to be extraordinary. And they have, a, they have to be a combination of instruments. I'll say three, fiscal, major fiscal stimulus. And we can talk more about that in a minute. Um, unconventional monetary policy, which is essentially providing lots of liquidity to make sure that this not becomes a financial crisis. And third, um, financial regulation. Uh, we need to make sure that banks can accommodate something that is part of the economic reality today, which is that people just don't have the means to pay their debts in the next, say, months. So we have to make sure that banks can handle that in a way that does not aggravate the problem. So fiscal, monetary, 
and financial. You mentioned uh, expanding on some of the fiscal uh, stimulus and the fiscal policies that countries should be doing. Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, what sorts of fiscal policies do governments need to be enacting right at this point? Well, this is the type of policy that requires a lot of information because what you need is to complement uh, people's incomes. Um, we need to come with a transfer that reaches, you know, a lot of Latin Americans uh, with uh, the, a mechanism that allows them to have some cash today so that they can go and buy basic goods, essentially food. So this is the fiscal policy of the day, is the policy of the transfers, uh, reaching out to millions of people to make sure that they have the minimum income to survive. This is the crucial element. This is a different fiscal policy. This is not the fiscal policy of increased uh, expenditures in infrastructure of, uh, you know, the typical Keynesian um, counter-cyclical fiscal policies. They are more unconventional in the sense that it's going directly to uh, the families and providing uh, income support. Of course, the, the, the first element in the fiscal stimulus package today is uh, health expenditures. We need to make sure that we have more kits for the tests, that we have more beds uh, in our hospitals and that we have the ventilators that eventually we will need as the curve um, continues to progress and we need to treat patients. So that's the number one element and it's the best, of course, uh, return investment that we could do today. But in addition to incomes to support families, in addition to uh, more expenditures in the health sector, we need to think about uh, firms, we need to think about companies, businesses, because um, if they don't get the support, they're going to be laying off people, they're going to be um, not paying their debts, uh, not paying their taxes. So in a sense, we have to think about ways in which we can support firms at this stage. And I think a lot of the mechanism is through credit, providing more credit to companies and making sure that they have more time um, to make their payments, that the payments are suspended. Okay, and uh, of course, over the last several days, a lot of companies have been discussing major stimulus packages, rescue packages, things like that. Um, in your estimation, what do you make of those uh, packages and which countries seem to be handling this well from an economic perspective and which perhaps need more to do more? Well, in general, Latin America is not as well prepared uh, on that front compared to the advanced economies. The advanced economies, can actually launch massive fiscal stimulus packages. Um, they don't have to worry about creating ratings. They don't have to worry about access to financing, which are the concerns of most countries in Latin America. So the size of the fiscal stimulus, in a way, is constrained by these forces um, that limited the ability of governments to run higher fiscal deficits. So in one way or another, all countries in the region are constrained by that. Some more, some less. For example, a country like Colombia can actually put forward a fiscal stimulus package of about 2% of GDP and can finance it without having to ask for additional lending from the multilaterals or placing bonds in the international market because it has savings through you know, uh, sovereign funds. Savings uh, that in the case of Colombia are close to about $3.7 billion. That's the first line of defense. You can use those savings and you can finance with those savings a large stimulus package. Same thing happens in Chile, same thing happens in Peru. But not all countries have these savings or sovereign funds. They have to think about how to access markets. And that's, you know, in, if you go to the other extreme, you have countries like Argentina or Ecuador that are very constrained because they're actually in the middle of adjustment programs. They were actually cutting the government deficit and they're, uh, they're constrained in terms of limited access to um, uh, international financing. So for them, it's a more uh, serious issue because it's, it's like, who's going to support? Who's going to provide the liquidity for these uh, massive uh, fiscal stimulus packages? Right, and that goes right into what I was about to ask you too, is that with countries having uh, very high debt to GDP ratios already in many cases in the region, uh, who can they borrow from? Um, and how can they target those economic packages uh, to the people who most need it and to preserve jobs? In this At the end of the day, um, in some countries earlier, in others later, 
but in all countries this will apply. We will need more external financing. That means, you know, currency financing in hard currency in US dollars. Um, the sources, the domestic sources are limited and in some countries are very risky. If you go into primary financing, if you just do like monetary expansion to finance a large fiscal deficit, you run into the risk of people using that extra liquidity to buy more dollars and that would just aggravate things because you'll see, you know, exchange rate is skyrocketing and you'll see inflation going up. So in, in most countries, external financing is needed. And that brings us to the issue of the multilaterals. Are the multilaterals equipped to finance this massive fiscal stimulus packages that the, the region requires? And the answer is no. They do have some space. They can actually provide some additional lending, but that's on the order of two, three billion dollars. And what the region needs is a lot more. So we really need to make sure um, that we have access to other sources of external financing. Placing bonds in today's international markets is very difficult. So what a lot of economists are thinking uh, as we speak right now is how can this region build a bridge to access the liquidity that is being generated by the monetary expansion, the QE that is taking place in the US, in Europe, in the advanced economies. We need to make sure that we can access that liquidity and bring it home to pay for this additional fiscal expenditures. And there's a good argument for this. Coronavirus is a global problem. You can solve it in one country, but it emerges in another country and can come back to you. So uh, this is not something that you can build you know, borders and barriers around these uh, virus. So it's a, it's a global issue, it's a global pandemic. So we need to make sure that we have access to international financing at this juncture. Some countries need it now, some countries need it later, but we will all need it uh, to the extent that this is really a game changer in terms of uh, the uh, fiscal expenditures that are needed. All right, Dr. Cardenas, I uh, think that's about all the questions I had to ask you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us. This is a topic we're certainly going to be returning to again and again, and I'm afraid it's something that's going to be with us for some time as we deal with the economic as well as the health-related fallout, of course, from COVID-19. Thanks, Jean. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Cardenas, for joining us. And uh, this has been a presentation of the Latin America Advisor Publications at the Inter-American Dialogue. I'm Jean Coletta in Washington.